All right. I'm glad to see you back. Um, I don't know about you, but during this time of coronavirus, when I'm spending so much time um, in my room, the biggest problem I have is my refrigerator. It's so close. Whereas usually when I'm working, I'm not around a refrigerator. Uh, I hate to say this, but I'm going to put on some weight, I think, in this virus epidemic or pandemic. Um, okay, let's talk about when we find ourselves doubting, when we find ourselves discouraged, Lord, strengthen my hope. How do you do that? How do, how do you do that? Um, let me just read you something from the New Testament. Jesus. Early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, went to a solitary place to pray. If you would uh, imagine anyone who wouldn't have any excuse to say, I'm not going to pray, it would be Jesus. And yet over and over and over again, he does something that initially the apostles don't understand. He finds a quiet place to go pray. And, you know, you hear the apostles saying, look, Jesus, where is he? Well, he's out praying again. Huh. Doesn't he understand there's a whole line out here of people who want to see him? And Jesus says, you know, i got to pray to my father. And finally the apostles catch on and say, I think you need to teach us. How do you pray? Not so much how to pray, but the importance of prayer. Hmm? Uh, how many times do we talk about people doing good things but burning out? Uh, doing good things but not with a good heart? Uh, how many times do we hear of people, <laughs> I hear this when I was pastor of parishes, uh, they all go to church but then they run each other over in a parking lot. Um, you know, um, we need to be people of prayer uh, no matter what happens. Our first responsibility is not doing charitable things, but hooking in to the God who has created us, who loves us, and in whom we find our source of life. Um, I, um, I, I, I just I, I worry about people who say, I don't have time to pray. Well, that might have worked before the virus, but you have plenty of time to pray now. There is no excuse. And people still finding excuses not to pray. Now, I have to be honest. Those of you who are parents who have kids at home, my heart goes out to you. I don't know how you do it. Uh, but for a lot of you, you're home quietly right now. Um, you have lots of time to pray. Yeah, I wish you were at work. I wish you were earning a living. But um, certainly you have time to pray, and you should be. Um, prayer begins with praising God. Um, you know, um, uh, let, let me back up on that. It really begins with listening. But what are you going to hear when God says, I love you, and I'm with you always, and I forgive you of your sins? You praise God. Huh? We jump right into, I need, I want, I got to have. Okay, that's fine. But the first thing that you and I do in prayer is to give praise to God for what we hear from God. And it's important that we understand that. Gratitude, gratitude uh, goes a long way. There are people who have everything that I think they should have and need, and they're just not grateful. <laughs> they're just unhappy all the time. And then there are people who um, I think to myself, I don't know how they do it. And yet they remain faithful to God. They don't use their, their suffering as an excuse to grow bitter with God, but they give praise to God each and every day. Uh, you must be a person of prayer. Um, without God, you have nothing. You are nothing. Why would you not communicate with the one who gives you everything that you not want, but need? And in these moments in which we're, we're lacking in hope or doubting, pray. It's a sign that you haven't lost hope in God. And what do I mean by prayer? You find a place of solitude. Yeah, I know, parents. I know that's hard to do, um, but we have to find, you know, uh, St. Teresa of Avila, again, uh, says that solitude is the road to Christian formation. She says we need to find time alone to be with God so that there aren't any distractions and to find that time so that 
well, as Jesus goes into the desert for 40 days to be alone with the Father, as he prays to the Father in the garden. Um, it is in solitude that God speaks to us. It's just that with all the distractions around us, we're not hearing what he says. So you must find some solitude in your life and use it to pray. And I've been told that one good thing to do during this virus time is to set up a schedule in your day in which you're not saying, what am I going to do next? Or, you know, exercise, eating, calling friends, prayer, uh, so that your day has some structure to it. Well, part of that structure should be a major part of that structure being a prayer. Um, and when you pray, um, you, you listen. You listen to God. Um, you listen with, a, with an open heart. Um, you know, like, I, I, I sometimes I would ask people to give me some, some of their knowledge or their wisdom. But I wasn't really listening because I wanted to hear what I wanted to hear. Uh, and when Jesus says to his Father, your will, not mine, be done, he's saying, I approach you in solitude, asking that your will may be revealed. I don't think it's going to be what I want. But, you know, when you read the lives of the great saints, um, very often Jesus leads them where they would rather not go. Hmm? And so the key in prayer is to empty our minds and our hearts and say, Lord, fill me up with your will, not mine. Um, Mary, Mary, I'm just, I'm just amazed at Mary. Every time I read the Magnificat, I think to myself, this is a, a young girl, 15, 16, 17, we don't know. Um, but she hears this, like you're going to be the mother of the Savior. Oh, okay. Hmm. Don't know how that's going to happen. That's what you and I would say. And Mary said, how is this to happen? And God doesn't really give her an answer. He doesn't say, we're going to go through this and this and this and this. And this. He says, no, you know, just trust in the Spirit. It'll happen. Um, if she had not been approaching God with an open heart and an open mind, I don't know how she would have handled that invite. And she did have free will. She wasn't forced to accept. But her prayer, the Magnificat, beautiful. Let me pray it again with you. My heart praises the Lord. My soul is glad because of God my Savior. He has remembered me, his lowly servant. From now on, all people will call me happy because of the great things the mighty God has done for me. His name is holy. From one generation to another, he shows mercy to those who honor him. He has stretched out his mighty arm, scattered the proud with all their plans. He has brought down mighty kings from their thrones, and he's lifted up the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things, and he sent away the rich with empty hands. He has kept the promise he made to our ancestors. There it is again, promises and has come to the help of your servant Israel. He has remembered to show mercy to Abraham and to all his descendants forever. What a prayer of gratitude, what a prayer of hope, what a prayer of understanding that even though she didn't understand how it was going to happen, she knew it would. When God begins a process, he brings it to completion. And the Magnificat is a prayer that expresses the source of hope in our lives that when God makes a promise, you can take it to the bank. Um, when we pray, what are we going to hear? Um, now, I've worked 32 years with those in jail and prison. I've, I've worked with a lot of tough people who have made some very bad choices. Okay. So when I tell them, I want you to be quiet and listen to the Lord, it gets them very nervous. Like, what am I going to hear from God? All my life, I've been told, well, when I was in school and got thrown out, I was a kid of bad behavior. You're never going to amount to anything. Sometimes my parents abandoned me. They were uh, my original authority figures. The judge tells me, if I see you one more time in court, I'm going to send you to prison for the rest of your life. And the police, when they're looking in the neighborhood for suspects, I'm the first one on their list. So my goal in life, Father, is to go under the radar when it comes to authority figure. I don't want to be around them. 
I never hear anything good. And God is the ultimate authority figure. And if there's anyone who's going to be angry with me, it's going to be God. So, Father, I want you to pray for me. And I think, well, yeah, I'll do that, but I want you to pray for yourself. I don't think God will hear me. I don't think he wants to hear me. Hmm. What are you going to hear when you open up your heart and are quiet and allow God to come in? What are you going to hear? I think this is what I hear. When Jesus was uh, baptized, remember how he goes into the River Jordan? And how when he comes out, we have the appearance of the Holy Spirit and the voice from the Father. This is my beloved in whom I am well pleased. Uh, whenever I pray, I hear God saying, Oh, Ron, I know you. I know your weaknesses. I know your idiosyncrasies. I know things that people who think you're great don't know and wouldn't think you're great if they did. Um, but you are my beloved, and I love you. I chose you not because you're worthy. Mm -mm. In fact, I chose it so that in you being a priest, thank God, he must really be real to pick you and do good things through you. Um, the first thing you're going to hear is what you need to hear the most. You are my beloved in whom I am well pleased. Now, you and I first heard that in our baptism. But unfortunately, we were baptized as little babies. We didn't understand it. And we relied on our parents to teach us that. And unfortunately, many times our parents didn't spend time with us explaining what baptism is all about. So when we pray the prayer, Oh Lord, I am not worthy of Mass, so many of us say, Oh Lord, I'm not worthy. And we don't hear the rest of the prayer, but only say the word and I shall be healed. Uh, our self-esteem doesn't rely on what people think of us. It doesn't depend on whether we're healthy, wealthy, wise. It doesn't depend on what kind of job we have or what title we're given. Our self-esteem comes from God's love for us. Not our love for God, but God's love for us. You are my beloved. And that's a hard sell to some people who have lived their, all their lives in trouble with God. And so I have found as a priest that um, most people need to be reassured that they're loved by God. Uh, and I have my fancy degrees in theology, but sometimes, uh, you know, I, when I tell them they're forgiven, they don't believe it because they don't feel they're worthy of it. And so you have to go back to the very basics and say, son, daughter, you are beloved by God. Always will. Always will be. God made you, and God does some great junk. Hmm? That's what you're going to hear when you start praying. And does anyone here not need to understand that? So who in their right mind would want to hear that? So you pray, and that's the first thing you hear. He knows you by name. You're not a barcode. You're not an email. Um, he, know, he knows what you're suffering. You know, when you pray, he knows what you're praying for even before you ask. So you're asking as a sign of your faith in him, not that you're going to get him to do something he doesn't want to do. Um, he knows you by name. Um, and and I, I think, you know, when people suffer, sometimes they think they're so unique, like I'm the only one that suffers this way. You're not unique. God knows you by name. He knows what suffering you're going through. You're no different than anybody else. And the good news is he loves you. Mm. You're not a statistic. And sometimes when I see the numbers running up on the coronavirus, I think to myself, why don't we at some of these press conferences bring up the names of people who have died, who we know, and let's pray for them before we start the, the conference? I mean, otherwise they're just numbers. These are our family members. These are real people. And we need to pray for them and remember that. Um, um, We'll also understand something that's very difficult to understand, and that is we really don't know what God is thinking. God is a God who's hidden. His ways are not our ways. Hmm? And when I pray, I have to honestly understand, like, I don't know why this is happening, but I put my faith in you, O Lord. 
and trust that his ways will bring about something good. Hmm? Yes, I know, there are all sorts of people saying that, you know, the coronavirus is because we're evil, just as I'm sure there are people that said that Hurricane Katrina destroyed New Orleans because they were evil. There are always those kind of people that are looking for excuses to, to condemn people. God doesn't do that kind of stuff. Um, God is hidden. His ways are not my ways. Um, but we've got to trust that his ways are the best ways. Um, I also want you to understand something. That when we talk about hope, we need to have a proper understanding of suffering. Hmm? Because there are an awful lot of people who don't understand why we suffer, that there's any purpose in suffering, and so at the first sign of suffering, they despair. Um, whether we like it or not, and the church's teaching is clear on this, uh, suffering entered this world through the disobedience of our ancestors. And at baptism, while we are forgiven of original sin, one of the consequences of that sin is that we suffer. And so suffering is always going to be part of our life. Uh, it's a way of life. And we also need to be honest about it. Much of the suffering we endure is a result of bad choices we make. For example, on a very simple level. Huh? I used to be able to eat pizza late at night. I can't do that anymore. If I eat pizza at night, I'm going to have indigestion all night. Make bad choices, going to suffer the consequences. I can't complain that I'm suffering. I made a lousy choice. And so we need to be honest about that. So much of the suffering that we whine about is because we make bad choices or we just don't have the courage to make better choices. And that's why at the end of the first talk, we don't have peace because we just don't have enough faith to make peace. I'm sorry. Children are hungry because we just don't have the, you know, the courage to feed them. And we have to take some responsibility uh, for the suffering that we see in the world. Um, and I know that there's evil in the world. And anyone who doesn't believe in that, you're making a terrible mistake. The devil goes around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. There is evil in the world. But I think we give the devil too much credit. Hmm? So much of the evil in the world is man-made. Uh, and so the devil didn't make me to do anything. I made bad choices. All he can do is tempt me. And if he deceives me, it's because my eye is not on God. And so we need to accept suffering as not only part of bad choices in the world, but the fact that there is evil and I haven't focused on God. But we need to be careful about something. We cannot judge the quality of God's love on the amount of suffering that we're doing. Hmm. Um, uh, because, um, uh, well, let, let, let me, going back to prosperity theology again, people say, well, you know, like Job, Job's friends say, well, you must have done something wrong. Bad things are happening to you. Prosperity theology says that a faithful person is going to prosper. And oh, the bad line is, if you're not prospering, you're obviously, you know, you're not doing the right thing, and God's punishing you. I had a woman in my parish years ago who left the parish. She joined another group, and her son developed uh, brain cancer. Uh, her son died. Uh, she called me. And she asked me if she could come and pray with me. And I said, of course. So she said, I was with this group and we went and we prayed for my son every day. And he died. And the people in my group told me that he died because I did not have enough faith. And I thought, I hope you never go back to that church again. Like what a disgusting thing to say. Like death doesn't, isn't part of our life. Uh, whenever we come into um, a Catholic church, we don't see a cross on the wall, we see a crucifix. And there's a big difference. A cross is the two bars. The crucifix is the corpse of Jesus hanging on the cross. Whether we like it or not, suffering is the road to salvation. It's what we do with suffering that determines whether it is a road that we take that results in glory. But there is no resurrection without suffering. And for any preacher to talk about resurrection without talking about suffering, 
and the sacrifices that you and I make is telling you what you want to hear. And that would make them very popular, no doubt about it. On the other hand, if you only got a preacher who talks about suffering all the time, uh, well, he's a, he's a masochist, okay? I mean, we have to understand that we are people of the resurrection, but there's no, no, no resurrection without suffering. And, and how to handle it? Those are people who are hopeful. We can handle it without being resentful and bitter. And there are people who I've known for years and years and years who think they were dealt a bad deck of cards and as a result, they're just better, and they use their suffering as an excuse you know, to turn their back on God, to rob, to steal, whatever. I gotta get out of this life, whatever I want, because there's, there's nothing, nothing else. Hmm? How do you handle suffering? Well, I think you need to take a look at Jesus. Hmm? Um, he traveled very, in, in very narrow geographic areas. He didn't heal everybody that he saw. But when he did heal, he said, not only am I healing out of a sense of compassion, but I'm also healing so that you might understand that I can do even greater things, even forgive you uh, of your sins. Whenever I see someone suffering, hmm, I don't say, well, this is God's will. I have no right to do that. Um, I also understand that I'm not probably going to get, take away all their, their suffering. For example, if somebody's ill and somebody says, well, I'm going to put this in the hands of God. I think that's good, but that's step two. Let's try step one first. Let's pray for God's healing, that his glory might be revealed. And you and I as Catholics aren't really good at that, are we? We're very eager to say, I'm going to put this in God's hands. Maybe that's not God's will. Maybe God's will may be, let's pray for healing so that others may be brought to the faith. Uh, how many people were brought to follow Christ because he saw, they saw the miracles that he performed? So don't be pray, afraid to pray for healing uh, when you see people who are suffering. And then, if it happens that there's no healing that takes place, then pray for a spiritual communion. <coughs> pray for healing of the heart. Uh, and, but most of all, your will, not mine, be done. And pray to the hidden God whose will is being done and perhaps the death of this person. Death is inevitable. Suffering is part of the process of rising, raising our life to new life. Um, make sure that we understand that. And uh, it's not something we necessarily want. Even Jesus, when he is in the garden, he says, Father, if it be your will, <coughs> I don't want this to happen to me, but if it be your will, then let this cup of suffering past, but no, all right, your will, not mine, be done. There it is. If Jesus could ask that suffering be alleviated, we have every right to ask that. It's just that the ultimate prayer is, having prayed for a, a remedial action for healing, that we also accept that sometimes it's not going to happen. Okay, a couple more things, and then I'm going to let you go. I am... Um, I talked to you about the importance of solitude as being the road to religious formation. But as St. Teresa says, our journey to heaven is not a private one. Solitude is necessary for formation, but our road to heaven is not a private one. Okay, so just as I say religion is not a spectator event, we have to function as, as, as being interactive with God, so too we need the church. We need the people of God. We need the community. Um, for the testimony that we receive from people who suffer and yet have found hope in God's answer to their prayers, or just being reassured that we're not the only ones going through this right now. And this is a challenge with the coronavirus, huh? How important it is to reach out to one another to understand that even though we're not gathering as a body to pray, we're still the church, and that we're on a journey to heaven as a church, and that we need to participate in the sacraments to the extent that we can, and then when this is over, we will perhaps have a greater appreciation of the sacraments. The sacraments are not private devotions. They're meant for the building up of the community. Huh? 
I am baptized so that I can assure others that as God tells me that I am forgiven, so you are forgiven and you are loved, so too with confession. I'm forgiven so that I might forgive. I am fed in Eucharist so that I might feed. I am given the Holy Spirit so that I might use my gifts for the building up of the community. My road to, to, to heaven involves the church. And the church at this time not only provides us with an opportunity to stream mass, to teach us how important it is to understand that we're with you at this moment, but it is also a reminder that you're not alone. You're not alone. And when you feel you're alone, sometimes it's easier to fall into that good old pity party. Hmm? And the last thing I want to tell you about hope is this. It must also lead to ministry. Just as I got done telling you that the sacraments are there to reach out to others. We hear in the scriptures that when you are hurting, when you are in pain, you are to reach out to those who are suffering. And in reaching out to them, your own wounds will be healed. Hmm? How many times does it feel good when you do something that you know you've done something to help other people's lives? Get out of yourself. Let your hope lead you to ministry. Like, I don't know how many phone calls I'm getting from people who haven't called me in a long time. And I'm not saying, Father, your wellness call number 11 today. But I know it is a wellness call. Oh, they just want to know how I'm doing. And I really appreciate that. that. That means a lot to me. How many people do you know who could benefit from a wellness call? You can do that at home. Uh, you can get on the internet. Mm -hmm. You can. I, could, I don't know how to do it. Uh, you, can get on your, <laughs> you can get on your phone. I mean, come on. Do the Skyping, the Zooming. I know there are some problems with Zooming, but be careful about that. But to the extent that you can, reach out to others to know that you're not alone. And in so doing, you will find that not only do you help them, but your own wounds, your own doubts will be reassured. Okay, I'm done. I want, though, to leave you with something from Romans, and then we're going to sing, okay? Um, people have their fav favorite passages. I have a ton of them. But number one, number one is the one that I'm going to read to you. It's poetry. It's poetry. It's St. It's Paul. It's uh, Romans uh, chapter 8, uh, verses 18 to the end. I mean, it's glory. And you can find different translations. And I have to be honest with you, the good news, not the best of my translations, but um, I'm going to read it to you anyways. All right, now I want you to sit back. I want you to put this down on paper, Romans 8, chapter 18 to the end. Okay, And I want you to spend some time reading this and be, um, be comforted, okay? I consider that what we suffer at this present time cannot be compared at all with the glory that's going to be revealed to us in Christ Jesus. All of creation waits with eager longing for God to reveal his children. For creation was condemned to lose its purpose, not of its own will, but because God willed it to be so. Yet there was always the hope that creation itself would one day be set free from its slavery to decay and would share the glorious freedom of the children of God. For we know that up to the present time, all of creation groans with pain, like the pain of childbirth. But it is not just creation alone which groans. We who have the Spirit as the first of God's gifts also groan within ourselves as we wait for God to make us his children and set our whole being free. For it was by hope that we were saved. And if we see what we hope for, then it really is not hope. For who of us hopes for something that we see? But if we hope for what we do not see, ah, then we wait for it with holy patience. In the same way, the Spirit also comes to help us, weak as we are, for we do not know how to pray. The Spirit himself pleads with God for us in groans that words can never express. 
And God, who sees into our hearts, knows what the thoughts of the Spirit are, because the Spirit pleads with God on behalf of his people and in accordance with his will. We know that in all things, God works for good with those who love him, those whom he has called according to his purpose. Those whom God has already chosen, he already set apart to become like his son, so that the son would be the first among many believers. And so those whom God set apart, he called, and those he called, he put right with himself, and he has shared his glory with them. And so in view of all of this, what can we say? If God is for us, who can be against us? Certainly not God, who did not even keep back his own son, but offered him for us all. He gave us his son. Will he not also freely give us whatever we need? Who will accuse God's chosen people? God himself declares them not guilty. Who then will condemn us? Not Christ Jesus, who died, or rather who was raised to life and is at the right side of the God pleading with us for him. Who then can separate us from the love of God? Can trouble do it? Or hardship or persecution? How about hunger or poverty or danger or death? As the scripture says, for your sake we are in danger of death at all times, but we're treated like sheep that are going to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we have complete victory through him who has loved us. For I am certain that nothing can separate us from his love, neither death, nor life, nor angels, or other heavenly powers or rulers, neither the present nor the future, neither the world above nor the world below. There is nothing in all creation that will ever be able to separate us from the love of God, which will always be ours through Christ Jesus our Lord. Okay. Romans 8, 18 to the end. Listen, I want you to pray for me. I'm going to pray for you. And I don't take your promises lightly, and I don't make my promises lightly. We're in this together. Why? Because God's grace is sufficient for us. We'll be victorious. I think um, I want you to, I was going to say hug each other, but I guess you can't do that, huh? Say kind words to one another. I think we're still allowed to do that. And I hope that with God's will, maybe next year I'll still be here. And you will as well. And who knows, maybe next year when I give the day of prayer, we'll all be able to hug each other and eat with each other and make it a time well, that will be remindful of how important it is for us to understand that we're a church. But in the meantime, don't ever lose hope. Amen. Okay, how about a song? Though the mountains may fall. Though the mountains may fall and the fields turn to dust, yet the love of the Lord will stand. As the shelter for all who will call on his name, sing the praise and the glory of God. Go to him when you're weary, he will just give you eagle's wings. You will run never tired, for your cause will be your strength. Though the mountains may fall and the hills turn to dust, yet the love of the Lord will stand as a shelter for all who will call on his name, sing the praise and the glory of God. Thank you, ladies. And may God bless us all in his name, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.